I recently caught up with Brian Sedio of the University of Michigan, who has a paper in the Journal of Ecology on Coexistence of Species in the Genus Psychotria in Panama. What problem was your study trying to solve, or what motivated your study? So there's a problem that was identified even by Charles Darwin uh, back when he wrote The Origin of Species, but was uh, sort of also appreciated by Evelyn Hutchinson, and more recently by the botanist uh, Al Gentry. And that is that there are many closely related species that have appear to coexist. And is, as Darwin pointed out, closely related species tend to be similar in their, in their traits and then in the niches that they exploit. And so on the one hand, you'd expect closely related species to prefer to live in similar, in similar environments. And yet on the other hand, because they're so similar, they ought to compete more intensively and therefore not be able to coexist. So the way that relatedness influences uh, coexistence of species uh, isn't straightforward and may depend on which traits are more evolutionarily labile and more easily evolved to influence the, the niche of species. And so, so Al Gentry, when he was uh, surveying plant communities in the, in the tropical Andes, noticed that there are a handful of genera that really make up a large proportion of the species richness of the rainforest. And in fact, on, in Panama, um, even just five genera can make up a, a fourth of the species richness of the forest. And uh, so Gentry referred to these as species swarms. And so I set out to, to address in which ways and along which dimensions, ecological dimensions, these species swarms may have diverged, how close relatives may have diverged and actually be doing things differently, though it may appear at first glance that they're all the same. Could you describe in brief what your uh, main finding or findings were? So what we found was that at a very fine spatial scale, even within the genus Psychotria, which is uh, one of the most diverse genera in the world, the species that co-occurred, that lived within three meters of each other, were more closely related than predicted by chance. And that appears to be because of an environmental filter that is uh, dry season soil moisture that ends up filtering species into local communities based on their ability to tolerate seasonal drought. And because these hydraulic traits that we measured are phylogenetically conserved, whether it's a, a small depression that remains wet during the dry season or a small outcropping that really dries out in the dry season, it ends up filtering a, a, a community of psychotria that are able to tolerate that environment, and those tend to be close relatives. Can you describe a bit about the natural history of, of uh, the Psychotria genus? Are there any interesting um, bits of natural history? Yeah, so Psychotria is actually a, a, a relatively well-studied genus, and it's, it's quite interesting in its natural history. I think it, depending on the current taxonomy, is the third largest angiosperm genus on the planet. So it's pan-tropical. It's fallen all over the world, but it has a center of diversity in the tropical Andes. And like I mentioned earlier, Al Gentry noticed it because of its extreme local species richness. I think in Yasuni National Park in Ecuador, there are over 60 species in a relatively small spatial area. And they tend to, most of the species, to appear to be quite ecologically similar. And so that's why it's kind of caught people's attention as to you know, what, what are these things doing differently. So there are a number of ideas and how, what, they, what actually might distinguish them and, and what has driven their speciation. Gentry was fascinated by the potential role of the Andes, and the idea being that, you know, as the Andes grew up, it kind of isolated populations in these little valleys, and they may have uh, speciated allopatrically as they get, became separated in these valleys, and then uh, through, through distribution, through dispersal, you know, come into secondary contact, and so you have all these species that are really just carbon copies of each other that happen to drift apart in these valleys. But another, another idea is that because they're, they're very small, I think, um, you know, they're, they're understory shrubs, really, and a couple of species can get into the, the uh, subcanopy. But this might actually exacerbate dispersal limitation. And so even over relatively small spatial scales, they may fail to disperse and therefore be more prone to allopatric speciation. So, so in the paper you argued that um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the factors that might reduce sort of the importance of competition uh, between psychotria species is the fact that um, sort of the overstory um, 
plant species are are sort of uh, depressing their performance enough that they they don't, or they're or maybe they're competing with the overstory species that they don't really compete with each other. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's an interesting idea that they really don't compete with each other because they're at least four resources, because the overstory basically controls resource levels to such an extent that being next to another tiny shrub doesn't really qualitatively influence the availability of water, light, or nutrients. And so the evidence for this is that if these understory plants are given extra water or are grown in, in full sunlight, they all do better. And yet, if you do a, an understory removal experiment and, and remove half of the understory plants, the remaining plants don't do measurably better than they did when competing with these other understory plants. So, but it's kind of hard to wrap one's mind around at first, the, the concept that they are not controlled by resource availability. Because ultimately that's what controls, that's what sets an upper limit on population density. And so, what I think, and, and this isn't really my idea, this I have to attribute to uh, Stefan Schnitzer um, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, but in the absence of resource competition, what might control the abundance of these understory plants is actually the frequency of canopy gaps. So if one thinks of different niches in the regeneration of trees as being dictated by whether one can, can hang out in the understory or must exploit gaps, these gap specialist trees, they, they shoot up really quick as soon as they get a, an influx of light and nutrients in a gap. But these understory shrubs even the ones that aren't gap specialists, they can survive in the understory, but they probably aren't reproducing much in the understory. I mean, they put out some fruit, but I bet over time uh, their population would die out were it not for canopy gaps. But so unlike canopy spe or gap specialist trees, these understory shrubs probably hang out in the understory, and rather than shooting up and allocating all their energy to growth, when a gap opens up, they allocate all their energy to reproduction. And so, um, so yeah, so ultimately it would be the, the frequency of canopy gaps that would allow them to reproduce enough to maintain a, a net positive or net equal population change. Um, so, so in the discussion um, you talked about, you posed an interesting um, hypothesis that, uh, uh, that the biogeographic origins of the, um, at the stand level would have something to do with um, uh, you know, the phylogenetic history and sort of the, the, the deep history of the genus would, would have a lot to do with sort of um, current current conditions with the genus. Um, can, you, can you go into that a little more? Yeah, so I found it intriguing, this pattern that close relatives actually prefer similar microhabitats, even on the scale of three meters, and, and that within the genus, closely related species are more likely to, to have similar hydraulic traits and, and habitat preferences. So one potential explanation would be that what we're actually looking at is uh, several distinct radiations that occurred in, in climatically different regions and have only relatively recently in the grand scheme of things come together in central Panama. So a lineage that would have diversified in a relatively dry region would on average contain species that are able to tolerate seasonal drought, whereas a phylogenetic lineage within the genus that diversified in a, in a wetter region would be biased towards uh, an absence of drought tolerance traits. And so as these, potentially after the, the closure of the Isthmus of Panama, when these lineages would have come together, they may filter out on even small spatial scales relative to their, their habitat preferences, which are in fact a legacy of the regions in which they diversified. So, so how general do you think the results from your study are, uh, and w in what cases would you expect the same uh, the same patterns? Well, that's uh, that's actually an interesting question. So, my results are quite different from similar studies that have been done in temperate floras, and th there's only a small number, and they've been done in the California chaparral, uh, Florida oak communities, and also the um, South African Cape floristic region, all of which are relatively temperate climates with a much different history of biogeographic change than Central American rainforests. So the fact that the pattern is 
pretty much the opposite, as these other studies have found, may not be incidental. It might have a lot to do with the history of biogeographic change in Central America and the relative importance of these environmental factors in the diversification of lineages uh, versus other factors, perhaps um, species interactions mediated by pests and pathogens, for example. What do you think the consequences are for the, for the, the field of this paper? Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see whether the pattern that we've identified is, is indicative of the influence of recent biogeographic change in Central America. I also think it'll be interesting to see if this is a pattern that, that holds true for many of the, the species swarms identified by Al Gentry. And it, because it's suggestive of the relative evolutionary lability, the relative ease of change of these environmental traits as compared to, to other traits. I mean, Psychotria is a genus that, even as, as the name belies, it's known for its, its chemical compounds. They're psychotropic or hallucinogenic drugs. And so it's potentially interesting that these large genera of tropical forest plants may have relatively conserved habitat preferences while their diversification may be driven by their interactions with pathogens and pests and their, their chemical evolution. And so our, our study is, is suggestive of, of that, that hypothesis. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for chatting with us. Okay, thanks.